Thanks for joining. My name is Ovidiu Marcu. I'm a postdoc at the University of Luxembourg. Virtual log structured storage for high performance streaming is a working collaboration with Alexandru Costan and Gabriel Antoniu from INRIA France and Bogdan Nicolae from Argon National Laboratory. The context of our work is the big data streaming pipeline. As you know, over the past decade, big data evolved from batch processing to real-time streaming. And processing engines like Spark or Flink are able to process large volumes of real-time data streams in a fault-tolerant and scalable way. Still, they depend on the critical ingestion and storage layers. The ingestion and storage systems are required to provide data streams with low latency and high throughput in a durable and consistent way. Recently, the trend is to ingest from a few or tens of large streams in HPC, for example, at CERN, up to, given the IoT AI cloud context, we now have tens of thousands of managed streams. This change in data volume also impacts the data stream architecture, while requirements for durability and consistency are important and they characterize the whole system architecture. Stream ingestion and storage architecture is composed, as you can see, from a set of brokers. They are used to serve concurrent clients, producers and consumers. On the same note, leave backup that is responsible to store copies for ensuring durable ingestion of the managed stream topics and brokers. We are interested in our work to increase the stream storage cluster throughput when running multiple clients. Clients query once the coordinator for stream metadata. For example, what brokers are responsible for which partitions of a stream. This metadata is then cached and used until a crash happens. So this change error in the system requires clients to ask again the coordinator for the new metadata. Clients communicate directly with brokers for writes and reads. For scalability, a stream topic is partitioned. In Apache Kafka, a fixed number of partitions can be created for each topic, or as exemplifi exemplifi exemplified here in Kera, we can create a stream on a set of n brokers. We can start with one or a few, and each topic is then divided in a number of logical containers that we call streamlets, m, which is larger than n. And they are further divided in fixed size partitions that we call groups. So each partition or streamlet contains multiple fixed size partition, subpartitions called groups. The number of streamlets is larger than the number of brokers to ensure horizontal scalability. While the groups can be consumed in parallel, they are dynamically created, so this ens ensures vertical scalability. At this point, we have defined the broker's architecture, the partitioning, so let me next introduce the producer's architecture. Its role in the end-to-end -end architecture before I describe the challenge and motivation of this work. As depicted here, a producer, which is multi-threaded, will first aggregate a set of records in a chunk of configurable size, the partition chunk. And many chunks are then grouped together in a request that will be sent for ingestion after a configurable timeout. So these producer requests are sent in parallel to multiple produ pro brokers from multiple producers. And in practice, the chunk size, the request size, and the timeout of a specific chunk. How so how much time you wait on the producer before it is sent to the, to the broker for a chunk. And the number of parallel requests, RPCs, are chosen carefully in order to trade off latency and throughput. Each chunk arrives on the broker is appended, as, you, as we can see, in an in-memory buffer of a stream partition. And then the broker, after replicating this chunk, acknowledges the append to the client. 
In practice, if we move on the broker side, each partition is represented and implemented as a replicated log. So once the broker acquired the chunk, and as you can see the replicated log has a number of segments, only one open segment to accept new appends, on the backups there is a corresponding open in-memory buffer segment where the chunk is replicated. Once the broker has acquired the chunk, it will push it to the backups, or eventually backups will pull it, depending on the push or pull-based replication strategy. And then clients are acknowledged, the chunk being durably acquired. The main question of this work is how to organize distributed stream partitions in order to improve replication, so to improve the system throughput. Compared to this approach where a partition is backed by one replicated log. One option in state of the art, in particular Apache Kafka, is to use the one replicated log per partition. You can see in this architecture we have a set of brokers. Stream storage systems adopt the primary backup mechanism where the primary replica, in this case broker one, is the leader of the partition one, responds to clients, while Brokers 2 and 3 will be followers for partition 1, holding a copy, pulling its data from the leader trying to get in and remain in sync with it. However, a lar at large scale, with multiple clients and tens of thousands of partitions, we observe we encounter issues due to stream topic metadata access on brokers and increased competition due to network RPCIOs. Another option is, similarly to the previous one, a partition manages a set of logs, so the multi-log. This was previously implemented in Kera as an alternative. It's a good approach for handling a few high-throughput streams. Also, although it allows parallel appends, since each log has multiple, uh, since each partition has multiple logs, uh, fortunately. Each log requires an in-memory segment on backups to hold copies, so this approach requires a lot of in-memory storage just for the replication. Let me now introduce our proposal where we implement the idea of separating the partitioning from the replication. The partitioning, as depicted here on the broker, shows one partition called Streamlet with one segment. The producer just pushed one chunk that was acquired into the segment 1 of the streamlet 1. For the replication, we use a shared distributed replicated log that we call the virtual log. The virtual log is similarly implemented to a replicated log. However, it does not hold data, but metadata or references to the actual chunks on the broker managing the virtual log. The advantage is, since to a virtual log we can associate multiple partitions, in the end we can consolidate multiple RPCs into a single one with respect to replication, hoping to increase the replication throughput and thus the cluster ingestion throughput. Let me recap our proposal, where we separate the partitioning from the replication through the virtual log transparently associating stream partitions with one or many replicated virtual logs. In this example, we illustrate one virtual log that references chunks from two partitions. The chunks are replicated in the order of their appends to the virtual log. We maintain consistent ordering and safe reconstruction at recovery time through the chunk metadata that is also stored inside the replicated virtual segment. For evaluating the implementation, we run on the GRID 5000 infrastructure, a set of experiments that are similar to the open messaging benchmark, a synthetic benchmark. We evaluate a number of parameters that we have seen are relevant to the performance of the whole ingestion storage cluster. In particular, the number of partitions relevant to the scalability of the processing engine, while the chunk size and timeout are relevant to trading of latency and throughput. 
Our setup contains four brokers deployed on separate nodes from the clients that are producers and consumers running in parallel. Each broker has 16 cores, one of which is dedicated to pull the network for new RPC requests. The rest 15 cores are used as worker threads. We compared replicated Kera with Kafka. We choose various configurations. Some are optimized for high throughput like this one. On the horizontal axis, the chunk size, 32 or 64 kilobytes, corresponds to a request size which is eight times larger. One chunk for each partition. We run 16 or 32 concurrent producers. We observe that Kera obtains a larger uh, cluster throughput. Um, the cluster throughput is computing by averaging on, ev on every se second uh, the client's throughput and uh, aggregating it. So Kera in this uh, experiment is limited by disk, obtaining 7 to 8 million records per second with 16 or 32 producers. We configured the same experiment to replicate this time in memory, so removing the disk bottleneck, while deploying singularity containers on the HPC cluster of the University of Luxembourg. A similar configuration, each container has 16 cores and 128 gigabits of RAM. We choose for Kera two configurations for the RPC network communications, one using TCP, another one based on InfiniBand RDMA. When using InfiniBand versus TCP, we observe the system throughput is um, about 2.5 times better. So we observe the system throughput increases considerably uh, versus the other experiments uh, since the limit now is on the client, on a single client throughput. How many records a client, a producer can send in a second. Kera therefore could be used as a caching solution for uh, HPC simulations. Going back to experiments on Grid 5000, when we try a configuration with a large number of streams, so from 64 to 512 streams, we reduce also the chunk size to one kilobyte for each partition. We increase the replication factor from one to three. Kera still maintains an advantage of about 2.5x increasing throughput over Kafka. From replication one to replication two, we observe a drop in performance of about 50%. With the replication factor three, uh, throughput is uh, similar since the broker, um, the primary replica, uh, replicates synchronously to, to the backups. To understand, to understand the impact of the virtual log on performance, we ingest the same 500 streams with one kilobyte chunk using 16 clients, eight producers and eight consumers running in parallel. While we increase the number of virtual logs for replication factor three, we observe that on both Grid 5000 and the HPC cluster, for about for two virtual logs, we obtain a maximum cluster throughput So now you expect that having more virtual logs will give in theory greater throughput. However, at some point it seems that for a low latency scenario like this one, chunks are small. We only need about two replicated virtual logs to obtain the highest throughput of this configuration with replication factor three. Adding more logs, more virtual logs makes the system lose some performance. The top graph corresponds to experiments run on GRI 5000. The bottom graph corresponds to experiments running on the HPC cluster over InfiniBand, where we observe a similar trade-off. So we replicate the virtual log replication factor capacity.
on, a, on another hardware setup. Another scenario for a high throughput configuration, ingesting one stream with 32 partitions with 16 clients, concurrent clients. Um, well, we increase the number of virtual logs to keep up with the ingestion rate. We observe that for eight virtual logs, we obtain a maximum cluster throughput. This is a high throughput scenario. And as expected, we needed more logs. However, we, we can uh, leverage this configuration to reduce the in-memory um, buffer uh, size needed to just do the replication. To conclude, separating stream partitioning and rep replication can help increase the cluster throughput while tuning the virtual log, the system replication capacity depends on the workload that is the lab, which is going to trade off latency and throughput. For future work, we plan to automatically tune system configs and study crash recovery while collocating storage and processing systems. Our implementation is open source and available online. We also have tutorials on how to run this software on bare metal or using containers over an HPC cluster with InfiniBand, Singularity and Slar. I'd be happy to take further questions. Thank you. this yet, but what, what do you think would be um, a reasonable upper limit, assuming you can get enough parallelism out of it? So it, it depends on the um, maybe durability requirements. Okay. If we, if we wanted to simply ingest and leverage uh, that data right from in memory, Mm -hmm. then we are potentially limited by memory bandwidth unless network is uh, scarce. Okay. Um, the, the, the system itself is uh, uh, quite configurable. So it has a number of parameters exposed. Um, as, as a technical detail, we, we ingest in, in memory eight megabytes uh, segments. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's a custom memory uh, sized system uh, and this helps a lot with um, with a binary format so it's uh, the, the rpc just takes the data and uh, appends it uh, it's as simple as that now if if you add the replication durability then then you start to lose some some throughput but i'm interested in uh, in that use case okay all right great um, I'm trying to see if there are any other questions before I ask more here, but we had a couple of minutes, so I'll go ahead and ask anyway. So the, one of the other questions I had was, um, one of the other projects that I've worked on of late was looking at uh, ensuring that we have a guarantee of message delivery from some source through some number of hops to some destination. And uh, Kafka was one of the tools that we looked at and realized that 
unless you very, very carefully configured it, there were no guarantees of message delivery through Kafka. And um, since you're comparing against Kafka, I'm curious what your um, thoughts are in terms of the ability to like, guarantee that messages are going to be delivered. When, when we acquire a, a chunk, mm -hmm. we, we manage some um, some metadata. Um, that chunk was acquired on, uh, on the primary. Then um, if that chunk was replicated, so the replication um, is done in parallel, but is uh, synchronized, so you get uh, an answer. So the log itself also ensures uh, this integrity and um, Acknowledgement, and ultimately, it's on the on the client side how you how you manage the RPC semantics. Uh, now, the the whole system is built on on top of a um, strongly consistent uh, key value store, the RAM cloud. Mm -hmm. uh, when we started the project, we needed some um, uh, components to reuse the RPC system. Uh, then uh, you have the the network communication, which is flexible, so allows you to switch TCP or uh, infinite band. Mm -hmm. uh, but for uh, for our uh, um, examples here, for example, consumers only only see data that was um, uh, acknowledged to be replicated. Uh, in Kafka, the protocol is a little bit different. Uh, we compared um, maybe on a, on a feature wise, uh, so features, you can do the same thing, but uh, systems, the two systems have, uh, let's say two different uh, architectures. Although the user can, will see eventually an API which, that is similar. Um, so you have more, more guarantees on, uh, on the Kera system. Uh, and if you want to go for a linearizability, you can add the, those semantics to the RPC. Okay. Hope you um, did respond to your, your question. Right. No, no, it does. It does. Um, it, it, it's a different kind of thing and it has um, different features and in many ways you can actually make it to be just as reliable or more so. Yeah. Okay. Um, are there any other questions? I'm having difficulty seeing the questions that might be in the chat. No questions, all right. Um, let me see, would be another interesting question to ask. Um, so your message sizes that you're dealing with, uh, you scaled them a fair ways from like 1K up to several megabytes. Is there a, like an upper limit that you would realistically look at or is it, uh, just in the multi megabytes, could it go into the gigabytes, for example? For for a message or record size, mm -hmm. it essentially is limited by the in memory buffer size of the system. So we configured eight megabytes for a, for a segment. The segment is used for everything, for the partition segment, for the replication segment. So you can go up to eight megabytes. Okay. For one, one record size. Right. Including um, some bytes for the metadata. So the chunk mm -hmm. representation. But if you have more, uh, so if you have larger uh, messages, then you just have to ad adjust the, the system. Okay. All right. Um, so given that, that the message sizes are kind of system based, then um, is there any limitations based off of the kind of storage devices that you're using? So I know you're doing a lot of in-memory pieces, but um, does NVMe or SSDs or persistent memory get you any advantages other than performance? The backup has uh, uh, some implementation. Um, it, it can go on disk SSD. <laughs> we haven't tested uh, other persistent in memory hardware with it. Um, in Kera, you, you, you have also this facility to configure um, 
a number of segments uh, and think of them as uh, uh, being durable. Mm -hmm. So you, you say like, like you have one gig of uh, durable memory and, um, and then you also write to disk. And th this memory is durable because of many things. It can be maybe some persistent memory or it can be backed by uh, batteries. That was an, mm -hmm. an initial assumption. Oh, OK. All right. But we haven't tested this disk um, capacity. Like, for example, if you associate uh, multiple disk instances with um, one broker process. Right. OK. But it's an, it's an interesting uh, um, subject, actually, for, uh, mm -hmm. for So where do you, do you see this project going next, or are you done with this project and moving on? Uh, we, we actually have a, have a project to, to start here at the University of Luxembourg um, in a project um, going to to bridge HPC cloud. So we hope to leverage this software to use it like an in-memory cache and then uh, have it installed on, uh, on nodes with a large memory. Uh, so to have a, a stream-wise uh, in-memory processing. Okay, uh, and what workloads are you thinking you're going to run through that? Perhaps um, processing uh, satellite images. Okay. And I, I, I hope eventually also the, the STA project that was uh, actually a use case in my uh, in my PhD uh, big storage project. Okay. But but we never uh, never seen any data from that. <laughs> Oh, okay. Apart from yeah. the, the architecture and uh, the big ideas to, to stream that, uh, that yeah. big number of terabytes. Yeah. Well, when you, when you get a chance to visit Cape Town, you can go visit them. They, they're welcome visitors. So Great. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you. So our next speaker is Sarah Neuwirth, and she's going to tell us about some uh, how to evaluate parallel I.O. given the kinds of workloads that uh, are emerging these days. Thank you, Che, for the introduction. Let me share my slides. Um, I hope you can see them. Then um, let's get started. Thank you for having me today. And I know that the title sounds ambitious, given the timeline, but this has been a work that I have been working on with uh, a call, um, a research partner from Oak Ridge, and I'd like um, to talk about current challenges, what we're doing, and where we need, go, need to go next. And the first question when you encounter a storage and I.O. and you want to optimize or evaluate it even just in the beginning is the question why Perl I.O. is so difficult. And when you think about it, you have different um, communities having a different perspective on the same problem. So for scientists and scientific code developers, they don't really care about your storage layers or how the hardware is implemented or any other layers of abstraction or complexity that are being added by um, systems. They mostly think about their science problem in terms of molecules, atoms, grid cells, particles, whatever type of data they're working with. And that's something we have been observing in the last couple of years, getting more and more challenging to address in terms of evaluating, predicting, and optimizing. Why? Well, if you look back at the I.O. stack that you see on a common HPC system nowadays, it is getting increasingly complex. What you can see on the bottom here are two figures that are literally giving you the same perspective, like different perspectives on the same problem. On the left side, you have a more traditional parallel I.O. stack that you would encounter on a traditional HPC system, which could be compared to the left side and the right figure, meaning on top you have the application, then you have 
different combinations of high-level I.O. libraries that could be HDF5, Parallel.net, CDF, or middleware such as Adios. And then you also have typically underneath MPI I.O. that is in turn encountering I.O. forwarding and ultimately the Perl file system and then the actual hardware. And on the right side, you see incorporated more recent, what we call emerging workloads that are also incorporating um, novel domains such as cloud computing and virtual environments, but also um, workflows. And I'm coming to that in a second. But if you look at the different perspectives, the problem about understanding IO and then in turn optimizing it for your given use case comes with the application scientist perspective, which is saw on the like, slide before, where you do want to improve your IO in order to decrease the time to run your application and ultimately um, uh, present your scientific discovery. Then you do have the system administrators that are more related towards the operation and the procuring of new systems. And then on the third perspective is added by researchers that do not really care about what application scientists are trying to do. They're mo more focused on optimizing the actual storage systems and IO library design. And now this is getting more and more complicated, even though we all would benefit if we would find um, an approach to work on this together. Why? Traditionally, we have been observing box synchronous workloads, which are also addressed as scale-up workloads meaning those were um, more like byte intensive bursty workloads where you had defined IO phases. For example, we would write checkpoint data in order to have checkpoint and restart mechanisms. On the right side, there are quite a couple of access patterns that have been pretty common in your typical HPC application until I would say five to seven years ago. You could e either have, for example, a single writer, collecting all of the data from your processes, running on separate nodes, and then writing it into a file. You could encounter file per process IO, meaning that every single process was writing their own data into their own dedicated file. There is the approach of single shared file IO, where every process was writing into a shared file, but at different offsets, trying to minimize lock contention, ideally. And then Another approach is the collective buffering I.O., which is somewhat a combination of single writer and single shared file I.O., where you're basically collecting the I.O. from multiple processes and then have only multiple aggregators writing instead of every single process writing to the same file. In turn, again, minimizing lock fi file lock. Then there were other areas such as data input and data output, but usually in large read and writes. In recent years, we have been observing a shift towards emerging workloads, which are also addressed as scale-out workloads, which means that nowadays we do not only have traditional simulation and modeling workloads, as we have seen on the slide before, but now um, recent st studies have shown that researchers, scientists, application code developers have shifted into writing code that is not dominated by write IO, especially bursty write IO anymore, which has been a long and widely held belief by us, the IO optimizing community where I'm from, that if we're only dealing with very nice write intensive, maybe read intensive workloads. But now we have the emerging HPC workloads, meaning that in addition to the traditional workloads, we're also encountering artificial intelligence workloads, big data analytics, Deep learning, very common now are multi-step workflows and in-situ analysis, meaning that the IO characteristics of workloads have drastically changed. We're now having random small file accesses, non-sequential, metadata intensive, small transactions, a whole mix making it very difficult to analyze and optimize IO. And this is the main focus of today's talk. Um, my research partner, I, we have conducted uh, a survey. We have looked at the last five years trying to figure out what has been done and what is the current state of the art. And we came up with this chart, which basically shows you the typical IO performance analysis cycle, meaning you're starting on the left side, but you're typically running your workloads, either through real application code or other means. Then you use different tools to collect data and monitor your applications. 
and that the results of this stage are fed back into the modeling and prediction stage used to either model your workload or also predict future workloads in order to again optimize. And then on the right side, the third pillar of this cycle is simulation um, types and different techniques used to model and analyze systems. If you do not have access to the largest system, which let's be honest, a lot of people do, like even my university, I'm happy if I can work with a small test set. So if we look at the current state of the art, and I have to um, sort of speed up here, I think, otherwise I'll exceed my 20 minutes, are the different workload sources. Ideally, when you um, analyze I.O. and want to optimize your storage and I.O. layers in your system, the application code would be the most accurate workload. However, this is not always accessible. Why? Well, some of them are under an NDA, which makes them non-accessible to the researchers trying to optimize or the sysadmins trying to tweak the system. And then on the other side, you sometimes have the problem that these application codes cannot be scaled down to a size that can be reasonably run on a small test bed, meaning they're too large to be used for characterization purposes. And this leads to two different areas that are nowadays pretty common to analyze workloads or produce workloads that are then in turn used to understand storage and I.O. And those two areas are benchmarks and workload generation. And if you're closely looking at the items, you'll be like, but they look very similar. And they are because they somewhat relate to each other. So on the one hand, you have benchmarks, your traditional synthetic benchmarks, for example, where you have simple access patterns that can be used to stress your file system. And very popular ones are, for example, IOR and MD test for metadata tests. On the other hand, you have a pool of application benchmarks um, where they try to mimic the I.O. behavior, which is in turn somewhat related to proxy applications and I.O. skeletons. I think I would compare application benchmarks to proxy applications where you're sort of deriving the um, behavior of the code from your large scale application. Well, for example, when you move over to workload generation and look at I.O. skeletons, those tools are typically means where you can auto generate um, a benchmark for a given application. For example, if you look at Adios, it comes with a tool called Scale where you can use your IOS description to actually generate your scale benchmark, your skeleton. And then there are also workload generators that are um, relying on performance and monitoring data in order to generate workload that is similar or equal to the workload that has been observed by the system at a certain point of time. Then the next stage is data monitoring and collection still in the measurements and statistics collection. If you look at it, you have two different major areas. You have the profiling and the tracing. For profiling, it is more meant as you have IO characterization, meaning you're collecting statistics, file access times, timestamps, sizes that have been written or read, maybe file access patterns, and tools that are very popular in that community are, for example, Darshan, Vampire, Scorpio, but also Ascala, Scott, those are profiling tools. And then if you look on the tracing side, those are more resource heavy, why? Because they're basically tracing whatever's happening in your application and they're basically reporting the chronological order of your function and systems calls with timestamps, meaning it makes it much easier to follow what is happening. But at the same time, if you're thinking about running a large scale like application on hundreds of nodes, creating lots of data, you can see it that those logs will increase in size really, like really fast. But popular tools that have been used are Recorder or Score P. Also, Darshan has been recently extended to provide a tracing functionality. And then if you look at it, something that I haven't touched so far is what levels can be traced or profiled? Well, it depends on the tool. You have some tools that are much more on the server side, collecting statistics such as load on the servers load on the storage devices, 
you have easily accessible client side statistics because you're actually running your application from the client side. And then there are also workload manager tools, for example, from Slurm or Tor, which are sometimes also not easy accessible to the user, meaning that we have different levels of data monitoring and collection stages. We have the chop level, which is pretty easy. And then we do have the storage system level, which is sometimes only accessible to system administrators. And then we also have the end-to-end -end IO behavior where we're interested in how is it actually, like how is the whole application performing from the beginning to the end until the data is residing on your storage. Once we have collected the data, it is fed into the next stage. Remember the cycle we we're trying to model and predict, and um, I'm only barely touching this because those are very common techniques. The one is um, one area is the statistics technique, where you use a different kinds of statistic, um, uh, things like arithmetic mean, standard deviation, linear regression, Markov models, in order to understand what was happening. However, this needs extensive effort by human experts, meaning you need an understanding of the application or the workloads. And then we also have the systematic analysis where you either have the IO behavior of individual applications, meaning you only have the snapshot of one application, versus the IO behavior of the storage system as a whole, mostly not available to users. So you see, again, another layer of or another difficulty, how am I supposed to get access to that? And then we have a whole research community using all the information from the modeling and statistics collection process to use that to predict future IO requests, trying to optimize that. And recently we have seen a, a, um, a spike in the applic like a, a people applying machine learning analysis. This has become very, very popular in order to analyze the IO behavior, but also to and improve the I.O. behavior by using training sets from previous workloads, e.g. Darshan logs feeding into a machine learning tool. But we also are encountering a new problem, which is called workflow analysis, meaning we need to understand the critical abstractions where you see the flow of an application and all the different components. And this needs to be analyzed, but what we have been observing during our analysis of recent research, this has not been addressed so far, or very little work has been done in that area. Leading to the next pillar of modeling and prediction, workload generation. If we have IO traces and IO characterization files, those can be used to create so-called um, IO trace workloads or IO characterization workloads. The difficulty here is to extract information in a way that you can argue that the that workload that you're generating for your next run to, again, create your own benchmark um, is accurate or within a certain variance, but for example, only 5 to 10% off of the original application behavior. This can be very challenging. But there have been tools proposed. A, there is one paper that is describing very good techniques for modeling large-scale HPC IO. I have referenced that on the slide. And then there are also um, tools that are available to actually feed your IO trace or characterization workloads into the tool. One of them is IOWA, which relies on CODIS or Darshan logs. And then again, you can also artificially engineer your workloads by using an IO description language, but then you will need to have a very good understanding about the desired IO and access patterns. And one language that has been proposed in recent years is the CODES IO language. Leading to the last one of the five, uh, three pillars of the research cycle or the evaluation cycle, simulation types and techniques. When we were going through papers, we have observed that there are different kinds of simulator tools that are more or less accurate. And the most popular one are parallel discrete event simulations, where you basically use stochastic modeling tools, and you can even combine it with trace or profiling simulation, meaning you're using your IO characterization or IO traces to feed the discrete event simulator. The advantage of combining those two, I have highlighted them here on the slide, is that it's easier to validate because you're using information from previous runs. You have a somewhat accurate workload because again, you're using 
information of a system that has been already observed on that system and you have less randomness instead of just simulating your own for example io by artificially engineering your io and those two approaches are very very popular but limited in the sense that you can feed in your um your your io log either profiling or characterization log but there is no way to interact or execute an application. So this is also still an area where research needs to be done, leading to the third area here, the app or third tech type application execution driven simulations, where you can actually run your workload in a produce and consume event stream, meaning you're interleaving the application run with your simulator. And you have a more flexible way to study new workloads because then you do not need traces from other systems where this workload might have been run before because that's another challenge how do you get access to those if again you don't have a large scale system at home or a friend with a large scale system willing to give them your logs what are the key findings if you look at the current state of the art we do have great tools for monitoring analysis but they're somewhat limited meaning that if you look at common patterns and benchmarks there is currently a significant gap in the evaluation of io subsystems especially if you look at emerging workloads meaning we still are looking for common definitions for io patterns and benchmarks if you uh, if you consider a benchmark a proper mean to evaluate the performance there has been some work, there's only one work I am particularly aware of, DLIO, which is trying to focus on deep learning applications, but again, not that much work has been done yet, so leaving us for future work. And the second key finding is IO profiling and characterization. The tools that I have talked about, such as Darshan, Vampire, Scorpio, they're all, all targeted towards more traditional scale up workloads, meaning that any emerging workload cannot be evaluated that well with those tools at this point. There's one promising start. Darshan has been extended to support TensorFlow, but that's about it. Meaning, again, we need to develop methods to actually characterize the new IO workloads in order to understand and optimize them. And the third area is that for simulation and workload generators, there's still um, a gap in re like generating representative, uh, representative workload, meaning there is no standardized way to generate workload or even databases where you can trace, uh, can download traces for emerging workloads, leaving this as the third key research area for future directions in order to optimize parallel IO and storage. And this leads me to the end of my talk. Um, this has been a snapshot of current work. We have observed that there's still a lack in between the actual optimization we're doing for more traditional workloads versus understanding emerging workloads and getting optimization tools or just monitoring tools for those. And the inconvenient truth is that we're only getting started, meaning there's a lot of work to do in the areas of IO workflow analysis, tools for IO analysis, and understanding the changing workloads and their requirements. And that's why I summed up this slide with a couple of questions that I cannot answer. So if you're going to ask me them now during the Q&A, my answer will be, this is uh, to, be, like, to be figured out. Like we still are in the middle of trying to understand those workloads. And if you're interested in the complete work and all of the references, I encourage you to go to the paper that's actually related to this presentation because we have collected like 72 slides, uh, 72 references, I think, where you find more info, recent work about different workloads, characterization and trends. And now I'm, I'd be happy to take questions. All right, thank you, Sarah. So I'll start off with the questions asking uh, one of the ones that um, I've been thinking about as I've been looking at this work, and that is um, you mentioned something like scale for audios gives you a way to generate a way to, to characterize your workload. But if you just have an application, uh, what's a good way to get started to try to figure out what your workload might be so that you can pick one of these tools? 
So um, if you, you, so basically you're saying you have a scientific code and you just want to get started. Uh, my right. recommendation would be to just go um, and try Darshan or Recorder. Those two are very well documented and easy to use. So even if they're not installed system-wide, you can just download them and put them in your own user folder on the system. And this gives you at least an initial idea of what your application is doing and how your execution path is looking like. Um, so is that reasonably accurate? I know Darshan, depending on how you configure it, can either give you a great view or a terrible view. Um, uh, but, I, but I would well, but I would say that's true for every single tool that at least I know. They're all depending on how you configure them. Okay. I guess if you just want to understand what your application is doing, Recorder is a very easy way because you're basically just preloading your application and looking at the trace. That might be very straightforward as long as you're not doing that for, again, a 1,024 nodes run, because that could be in a free, like a large log file. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Um, so what do you think is a, uh, well, let me, let me rephrase that. I started wrong. Um, how well does a very small scale, like a one or two node benchmark seem to correspond to something that's more like 128 or a thousand node kind of benchmark? Uh, did you see any? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. That's one that, especially as an author of papers, you get very often. Yeah, yeah the problem with that is um, you sometimes cannot, or oftentimes cannot make any assumptions about it, how, how it's going to scale. Because if you only have two nodes or two clients trying to write to the file system, the pressure won't be there yet. But if you're increasing the scale, 128 nodes, for example, is already a much, much, much more stress on the file and IO system and also on the network, meaning that this is why simulators would be a great tool if there would be validated simulators that are accepted by the community. Because again, your test bed is great for implementing your work, but testing it at scale won't work with two nodes. Okay. Um, so given the information, is there a good way to get started trying to tune your application then after this? Or, or, or let me ask this a little bit different way. Um, once you have what your application's doing, how do you know if it's any good compared to what you should be able to get out of the system? That's also a good question. Well, what you would need is basically a baseline benchmark because typically there's like a peak. For example, if you're writing IO, there's a peak bandwidth that should be theoretically available, but given that every HPC resource is a shared system, You'll probably never observe it unless you're wrapping everyone at their bandwidth, which would be right. not cool. But um, yeah, that's that's actually a really, really great question. Um, my guess would be um, try to figure out what the theoretical peak bandwidth is and see the percentage that you're actually trying, like getting out of your application. And then if you're um, really far off, meaning like you're seeing only two or 3% of the real bandwidth, then there's something up going on, meaning that either your access patterns might be locking itself. Like that's something I was trying to explain with the shared file where you have multiple writers writing into the same file. And that's another um, complexity that is added by the file system where you, for example, have different servers, right? Where you have your storage devices connected to. And if you're not equally spreading them out, you could have writers locking themselves, meaning you see sequential IO, which is ultimately the worst one. So. Okay. Um, so uh, some work I don't know if you've seen because we haven't really gotten it out very far is uh, Radita Leem at um, Aachen. Um, I, she's, I it, yeah. She recently yeah. published that last month, right? Right, right. Yeah. So um, just for everybody else, um, she was trying to use the IO 500 benchmark as a way to um, see if her application was performing right and actually discovered system problems. Mm. Um, and um, so do you have any sense of where she might end up in this work? Because um, honestly, I look at it and I'm not sure uh, where it's going to end up. You mean ready to work? Yes. Uh -huh. So I didn't, I didn't have time to look at it yet, but my, okay. my assumption is that it will be equally complex as what we are trying to do. Just right. The problem yeah. is like, I'm, I'm a system engineer and I'm looking at optimizing the layers in between, right? And there right. are so many layers that can interfere with each other that optimizing right. one might result in decreasing the performance of the one underneath or on top of it. Right. 
Yeah. So I might feel that she's encountering something similar, especially if you're seeing that, saying that she has been seeing problems in the actual system. Yeah. And I feel like the answer to that is going to be a lot of work will be needed in order to get right. a full performance out of the system, even yeah. system specific sometimes. Right. Yeah. So uh, a little more details for other people as well who may not have seen it is that she, um, uh, she runs the IO500 benchmark and has the hard and easy for bandwidth and metadata tests. And what she discovered system problems was is that the easy tests were taking longer than the hard tests. And when she started to then investigate, discovered that there was actually problems in the, the system. And once they fixed those, then the performance inverted to what was expected where the hard was taking longer than the easy. Um, but her ultimate goal is to try to run the application and then use the, the, the bounding box essentially of the hard and easy for the metadata and for the bandwidth to try to say, if my application is somewhere in this region that I have some sense that it's good or bad. And um, trying to, to figure that out has it, been more challenging than any of us had guessed. I can only imagine. I mean, I, I remember talking to like 35 different experts in August yeah. and uh, the consensus was um, it's challenging and it will take yeah. a lot of effort. <laughs> I guess there's no good answer to that. Like yeah. you would need some sort of score for your system in order to understand whether your application is performing within the expect expected values for yeah. that system. But yeah. it doesn't mean that the same application will run on a different system equally well. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and then the other challenge that I know that she's facing is that um, since it's using IOR and MD tests, it's uh, avoiding any kind of IO library like HDF5, and mm -hmm. those have all their own overhead. So how you actually can try to cor or correlate the two to be able to get a, a, a matching result is something she's getting to investigate now. So. Well, what, what you could do is at least IOR supports HDF5, so you could mm -hmm. use that IO interface. But what we have been doing before is integrating the, uh, I think it has never been published open source, but the Adios API into IOR. Uh -huh. And you could uh -huh. use an Adios config file to run your IO benchmark. This might be of interest to her because she then could then yeah. flexibly switch it out. Okay, yeah, that's an interesting idea. All right. And I have not seen notification that we have any other questions and we are out of time anyway, but- Thank you. <laughs> yep, thank you, Sarah. All right, everybody. So uh, now that we've had our first two papers, we have a 15 minute break and then we're going to pick up with um, really a, a companion piece to what Sarah just prevent, uh, presented that's going to look at a particular kind of auto-tuning library. All right, see everybody in 15 minutes.